a meeting to order for the Soquel Creek Water District. And roll call would show all directors are present. So the first thing we have is a moment of silence, uh, recognizing the contributions of Laura Brown, who is a longtime director, um, sorry, general manager of the Water District. And uh, staff has given me some information about her that some of you may not be aware of. She retired five years ago, and after 17 years of dedication and commitment to the public service, she was a good general manager, will always be remembered for her open door policy, <coughs> special knack for storytelling. After years of intense planning for a supplemental water supply, her greatest gift was the well master plan, which resulted in the construction of both the Polo Grounds Well and the O'Neill Ranch Well. And of course, we're grateful for her leadership and direction through complex situations for the betterment of our community and our district. Well, thank you, everyone. We have no public hearing tonight. We have a consent agenda. Does anyone in the public or on the board wish to remove anything from the consent? Uh, just a 3.4. I have questions on 3.2 and 3.3. <laughs> sure. Anything else? I'll move approval of uh, 3.1 and 3.5. And I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, 3.2. Okay, so there was just, um, I, it was a, just a question uh, for the change order for the seascape well. I just mm. wanted to know the gist of that. Um, Taj here? No, he's not. Okay, can we pull that he's up? Walking he's, right he's walking in right now. He's walking in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I had a question about the change order for Seascape Well, just what that entailed. There are numerous items on that. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm sorry just about that. Ballpark. Ballpark for no, all I mean, the just, items. Just general. Things. We added a uh, chlorination uh, room, which was not originally in the plans because okay. it was going to be raw water. Um, and then, gosh. And I know the construction took longer. Yeah, they're still going. I know they're still going. Um, we recently just did a tie over from the raw water main to the distribution main so that we can use both uh, lines until okay. the state makes up their uh, recalculation of the MCL. Um, so was that one of the oh, changes? Oh, the biggest item, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, you caught me off guard. The biggest item was the well rehab where we installed a, uh, a stainless steel liner down to the, the screens where okay. the, we did this at Bonita Well five years ago as, uh, in addition to that. But there was a time when we were building wells with mild steel, and then we do stainless steel screens, and then a, a mild steel blank, and then stainless steel screens, and <coughs> the the blanks didn't do very well. Okay. And when we did do a video of Seascape, we decided to put in a uh, a liner all the way down to the screens to pre stainless. prevent yes, okay. yeah, and it prevents the if the deterioration of that other liner, which was looking like it was about to okay. fail. So that was the biggest change order with the well. Um, a lot of little, little things. We had to move the the main switch gear. Uh, PG&E gave us a little new news and said, "Oh, it needed to be over here." So we had to minor electrical stuff. Um, okay. So it was, it was a big list of things, and I'm sorry I don't have that. That's okay. Me. It was just the main ones that I was yeah. curious about. Thank you, you very bet. much, Todd. And you had three three. Yeah, there was just a question as you get, this is on page 15 of the 133 pages. It was just a 
thing I had question about. It's not even a big expense. Um, kind of in the middle of the page, it's State Water Resources Control Board Recycled Water Fees. I just didn't know what we have as far as recycled water fees right now, since we don't have any recycled water. <laughs> yeah, Melanie's not here tonight. That may and somehow be involved with um, part of either Pure Water Project or the feasibility study, probably the feasibility study, but I have to check and get back but to you. But go to the state water I know, board? we're getting a grant from them, but they do uh, charge us for certain items. And, and Christine, okay. is that anything related to you? Um, that potentially could be for our annual NPDES permit fee. We do the pay that annually to the, the state board. Um, okay. Well, it, it wouldn't be recycled water. Yeah, it wouldn't it be recycled water, recycled water for that one. That's yeah. the thing. Well, you can let me know later. Right? You know. I, that's we'll okay. I yeah. just if if you knew. Yeah. Anything else? I guess I could move approval of the warrants and the and the and the credit. All right. The purchase orders. I'll second okay. that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. The next was three four. Yeah, and I just I just noticed uh, in the production um, that there is a further jump, you know, jump in production in December. That was well, it's still lower than the peak uh, peak production uh, in previous in the 2014, I guess, is the uh, marker marking year. But it's still, you know, it was, I just wanted to know if you had any ideas on. Um, was December about. was a really dry month, uh, you know. Again, mm -hmm. so that's probably where I would. Do you think it's more? It was more like a summer month than a winter month, then, in terms of water use. Uh, no, I wouldn't think. I mean, well, it's it's it was just higher than November, and it was higher than the December before that, probably because of just the lack of uh, precipitation. So people probably needed to feel they had to do some irrigation but it is a trend the last eight months of the this year has been up compared to the previous years and, and I even calculated it was a 6.6 percent increase for the total year from just from last year significant yeah. well that I mean it was just that was the question whether it every time I see something like that is it just uh, the bounce back and I've talked to a number of customers and they talk about they're fed up with hauling water to their garden <laughs> and then or is it just a reflection of the future of California because of climate change you know and the, the general you know there's a, definitely a change in December in January even now even though it's rained mm -hmm. it's still a lot warmer than it, it you know is it past January as I should say don't you think mm -hmm. so yeah. you know just on high alert on that and, and I think another thing at the end of that report, we have it up on the screen. You can see since the the, the really low water usage there where the spike goes down, a, a slight gradual trend upwards. So, uh, and we are seeing that. Um, and, and if you do look at the evapotranspiration graph, it does show the weather index jumping from the month before. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, Mr. President, on 3.5, which is on the consent agenda and wasn't being raised, I want to disclose that I have represented North Bay Ford, who is the winning person. Not having nothing to do with his bid whatsoever. I didn't know about it until it showed up, but I wanted to make that disclosure. Okay, thank you. I anyway, that's all I had to say about it. So. I think this is informational, so we don't need to approve it. So, discussion? Um, so it's time for the oral communication. So anyone who wants to address the board on any item not on tonight's agenda, this would be the time. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Scott McGilvray. I live in Live Oak. I'm a, a founder of a group called Water for Santa Cruz County. I've been here a couple of times over the last two or three years. And uh, I want to uh, point out uh, something that's actually very good news for this, uh, this uh, water board, which is the amount of water that's available from Santa Cruz to help Soquel Creek. I noticed an informational item in the um, uh, minutes uh, where uh, Dr. Jaffe addressed misinformation he'd heard in the public. 
and he wanted to make clear that we are, Soquel Creek's willing to take water from the city of Santa Cruz in the amount of uh, the 300 acre feet per year. I believe that equates to about 95 million gallons, 100 million gallons, something like that. There's another statement, Dr. Jaffe will contact individuals for further discussion. I'm really happy to hear that because the real misinformation is that there's a lot more water available for you if you want it. Um, President Daniels noted that if the water is found to be compatible uh, and received from the city of Santa Cruz, the 300 acre feet or 95 million gallons is only 20% of what's needed to fix the problem. So a little math gets you to 500 million gallons. The really good news is there is 500 million gallons in Santa Cruz that you can have most of the time. There's more than that sometimes. It's water from the North Coast. One of the pieces of in misinformation that we are, have been suffering under is the idea that the only water you can get from Santa Cruz is gonna require a permit change because it's coming from the San Lorenzo River. That's actually not the case. All the water that you're gonna get for this 300 acre feet is coming from the North Coast because you can't get water from the San Lorenzo River. And there's more water there. Now I've spent six and a half years working on this since John Ricker brought the conjunctive use idea got a minute to go, thought that was the end. Um, and I have spent a lot of time working with the city of Santa Cruz, with the staff, with some of the water commission. They all agree that the water that's available is not limited to 100 million, acre, 100 million gallons. There's more behind that if you'll just take it. I've talked with the county, I've talked with the county water department. They also understand they are particularly excited about the prospect of water for you during the months of January through May because there's no way that water comes out of any Santa Cruz water supply because it's just running out to the sea. That's 245 million gallons. So you got a lot of water there. And what I want you to do is to accept our offer to explain it because we can't do it in three minutes. Happy to explain it, happy to have you look at all the numbers, talk them over with the county. So in the last five seconds. Thank you, I'm glad the subject is back before us. Please let us come and try to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening and happy new year. Becky Steinbrunner, a resident of Aptos, a customer of Pure Source Water Company. Um, I just want to really uh, support what Mr. McGilvery has said and urge you to really look into this. And Mr. Jaffe, I'm, Dr. Jaffe, I'm still looking forward to meeting with you and really welcome that opportunity. Um, and to that end, I, I just, in looking through the, um, the warrants for December, I see that for the um, advanced water purification project alone, it's almost $33,000 that were spent. Um, and that's a lot of money, and, th and this is just a drop in the bucket, proverbial, to, to what I know that you're spending. So uh, I really hope that you will take Mr. McGilvery's um, offer to heart and, and meet with him. He's done a tremendous amount of work. And there is a, a, a cheaper, more uh, quickly available answer to the water supply problem. I also uh, wanna hope that for the Connect the Drops event coming up February 1st, that I know your, your agency will be represented, that you do talk about this as a, a possible supply um, for the district and for the solution of the seawater intrusion problem with throughout Mid-County area. Um, and finally, is this the time that I could talk about correspondence? It changes, or sh would you prefer I wait and talk about correspondence at the end? Uh, that's when it occurs, so yeah, it has to be then. Okay, then all right, I have way. further communication to add to that, and, okay. and again, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment. Any uh, director impressions or responses? Oh, I have something to say. Okay. Um, I just wanted to let you know that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District is holding a board meeting on Thursday, and in that, among the items is the their fish monitoring contract with uh, uh, 
with Don Allen Associates, and uh, he was looking. Uh, I think uh, he has. Uh, they have an envi the environmental committee of the San Lorenzo Valley Women's Club is taking a strong uh, position on that and going to present at the meeting. So if anybody's interested, okay. going up there, it's in Boulder Creek. So. And then um, I also had one other thing. Uh, I know that's a meeting that's full of uh, meetings, but the Water Now Alliance is having their annual summit on the Thursday and Friday after the water reuse conference that's being held down in um, Monterey. And anyway, if it's actually a sort of a unique think out of the box kind of water summit. It's, I think the presenter last year, one of the presenters last year was the, the group in North Carolina who proposed the water rates, you know, so they, ha they bring in um, different speakers that, you know, have a very highly interactive uh, uh, program format, so it might be worth uh, going, and they, it's a free conference, and it's, uh, they even have some travel support, so, so it might be worth, uh, it's in Salt Lake City this year, but anyway, it's on the radar, I especially think Leslie might be interested. Uh, so that's that's all I have. Okay. I was going to mention that the uh, there was a, a report about the uh, um, someone from that has been coming here talking about uh, you know our, our handling of the uh, um, the herb, the grandparents' houses, um, and they had an article that came out in the uh, um, the. the so that one. Do yes, right. So that's it's out. Um, and in reaction to something that got said by the public, um, we actually can't go and just take this water out of the North Str Coast streams because it belongs to the city and they might fire bullets at us and that probably wouldn't be nice. And that the 300 acre feet that we talk about is all that they have offered us at this point. They may have others that they have, but they've only offered us 300. And that's only on years that it's actually available. So the average is gonna be less than 300, but that's what we've been offered and that's all we have rights to at this point, but things can change. Okay, so that being the case, we move on. The board calendar is 5.1. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just point out uh, two items. Uh, that's in the month of January. So coming up next Monday, uh, I mean, yeah, January 22nd is the Finance and Administrative Service uh, Standing Committee, four to five. And then uh, following that on the 24th is the GSP, Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory uh, Group Meeting, six to nine. I'd like to note that that's at the uh, Sheriff's Headquarters, so a little different location there for everybody to attend. That's all, unless you have questions on that. I have a question on the location. Is it, are they going to try and have the MJ meetings there too? Do you know? Because I think um, Supervisor Leopold mentioned that's a nice location. I I don't know. There there's some drawbacks to that facility as far as timing. We had to get special permission after that after that hour and and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So okay. But we can see how it how it how it works for us versus uh, the Simpkins Center. So it might be an option. Anything else? Okay, 5.2, board assignments, status report. Yeah, really nothing to report out there. Noted in red are uh, what recently the board's directed us toward, and of course we always strive to accomplish those items, and actually the first, our item B there under special projects, uh, is mentioned. I'll mention that later in the uh, agenda tonight. Any questions? Any comments? Okay, we move on to item 5.3, the quarterly organization-wide report. <coughs> Conservation customer service field, I just wanted to touch on the accessory dwelling unit item that's on the, in the report, and that's the introduction of Senate Bill 831, which is the third um, bill introduced by Senator Wachowski. And this one um, comes back and basically says that we cannot charge connection fees for any type of ADU. Um, right now, we are only prohibited from 
um, charging connection fees for those conversion ADUs that are constructed entirely within the square footage of a, a home or a permitted legal accessory structure. And so this would um, eliminate the ability to charge connection fees for any ADUs, and it also appears that it would limit our ability to collect impact fees or other fees. So water demand offset fees may be um, uh, targeted by this bill. And it just came out. Um, Bob Basso can follow up on a little bit of the, the research that he's done on that in the last week. Uh, were there any other questions about the status report? Sure. Yeah, I just, it wasn't really a question. It was just I liked, I, I liked getting the information that you gave about the different choices with metering. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, I, was, I guess my question would be, would it be helpful to agendize a discussion of that so the board can give direction on that at some point when you have more information? Sure. I think um, what we intended to do was put together a request for um, proposal from a consultant mm -hmm. to do an evaluation for us and at that time we would bring that RFP as a draft to the board okay. and ask for your input at that time okay if perfect. that sounds reasonable okay great I had a couple of questions um, you mentioned on the first page there are various constituents that you're testing for mm -hmm. and I wondered if you had contacted the regional board to see what items they is this the list of things they would require or are there other it, things that it they is might want? the same exact list of constituents that um, the city of, I think it was uh, Elk Grove, mm -hmm. worked with the regional board on a stormwater project, and this is what they tested okay. for. Good. Uh, there's not a lot of regulatory guidance out there right now, right. so we, we kind of went with what's already been approved and established. It may even well be that other regional boards would do different things too, so mm -hmm. yeah. So I wanted to make sure we were in contact with them. and know what we're doing with regard to that. Um, I have another thing on page 45. Um, under residential indoor um, conservation activities, mm -hmm. uh, you have, the, of course, the residential toilet rebate for the 0 0.8. Um, is there any other uh, toilet rebate activity going on, or is that basically taken over all of the so that rebate that's listed there mm -hmm. is the rebate that's funded with the water demand offset fees. Right. And so that's what, we're not funding toilet rebates for residential customers out of mm -hmm. our district rebate budget at this time. Okay. It's all being paid for by water demand offset. So in terms of toilet rebates, that, that situation is not additional. It's basically taken over all of our yeah, toilet rebates. Yeah, it's replaced the old rebate. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at things like our urban water management plan then, which probably was considering in the future more and more toilet rebates, mm -hmm. uh, since that's no longer happening, next time we do that, we need to take that into consideration that sure. know, we're not, not gonna get savings from toilet rebates anymore, because as you say, all that's going for the WDO. Yeah, and we, um, we also, when we redo our demand projections the next time around, whether that's before the urban plans do, um, or at the time the urban plans do in 2020, um, we'll also need to factor in some things we didn't account for, like accessory dwelling units and uh, cannabis yes. cultivation. So yeah, there's some things that were missed. Okay, thank you. Okay, where do we stand now? Engineering. Engineering, thank you. Um, well, the first item we talked a little bit about, um, I wanted to also mention that the Granite Way well um, is, we're coordinating with PG&E at this time for the power to the site, but obviously no construction has started, but it is basically on the shelf and we shouldn't take long to get that to you guys for calling for bids mm -hmm. um, in the next month or two. <clears throat> Today, uh, the biggest project that we have going is the Cornwell tank recoat, and uh, the contractor did uh, begin <coughs> removing of the interior coating uh, in the last couple of days, and we did get an opportunity to investigate and inspect some of the structural steel, um, and we did find that there is a substantial metal loss at the, uh, the top of the tank where the vent is. Mm -hmm. The I-beams sit on a, on a circular steel plate called the dollar plate, and that's typically where tanks usually corrode the most. And so um, we're gonna have to likely 
do a retrofit, a, some sort of structural retrofit on those I beams because they're they've lost at least fifty percent of their hmm. metal. Uh, we'll keep you posted, but it'll likely be a change order. Um, but it's not uncommon; it's been done before, and we'll keep you posted. Um, also on this list is the Soquel Drive cast iron project, which, knock on wood, has been relatively quiet with leaks, but um, it is on our radar. And um, as soon as this Cornwall tank project is a little more um, in day-to-day uh, -day operations, we can get started on that. But it'll also come to you for calling for bids, um, shooting for summertime, spring to summer of this year to go, go to bid. And then, of course, uh, it was discussed earlier in oral communications, the surface water pilot program. We are still um, looking at compatibility of the two waters. Um, they we're getting ready at the end of this month to initiate the, the, the tests with varying degrees of water um, <coughs> blending. Uh, right now, they're conditioning all the coupons, and we'll share those results as we get them. Initially, they did do uh, wire, uh, raw water, raw, raw wire um, samples, and initial results showed that um, the two waters are more compatible than we initially thought. So that is good news. It's not um, not definitive yet, but that test did conclude that they're pretty compatible. So okay. we'll we'll keep you posted as we go. Um, any other questions? There's a lot of, you see on the list there for fire services and water services, our, our staff's quite busy with some of the new and remodels going on. Any staff? I have a question. Yeah. What kind of cathodic protection do you use on your tanks? It's passive um, magnesium anodes. Anodes? That are anodes, yeah. And they were working properly? Uh, yeah, they work well for the parts of the tank that are submerged, but unfortunately, the roof uh, is not submerged, so it doesn't do much for that. But uh, they actually weren't, uh, you know, the, the rest of the tank is in pretty good shape, other than it, it's, it's not corroded, and most of the tank that's under the water line is in good shape. It's where there's that oxid oxidative state. And, and then you get the, cl the chlorine gas is also aggressive to any of the Non so you don't have to replace the cathodic protection with no no we don't we can reuse it yeah they're in good shape we have them uh, we have them evaluated and the last evaluation I think was just this last summer and um, the corrosion company said that there's nothing wrong with it so and you would see um, the anodes you know sacrifice and you'd see a pile of Mm -hmm. magnesium on the floor and they're in good shape still any other questions I had one uh, what's the status of this request for a sound wall on the southern boundary I mentioned it okay um, yeah we've we have a neighbor um, we the corporation yard butts up against Gary Drive which is residential and uh, some of our neighbors are well some of our neighbors are on Rosedale but there, uh, there's a, a home that's right up against our corporation yard, and um, currently there is uh, a chain link fence separating the yard. There's also a, a another type of fence, I think, but it's not a it's not a substantial fence, and so there is some sound that does get generated in our our lot, and um, that was a suggestion by that neighbor is you know having more of a like a ten foot block wall. Mm -hmm. um, along that southern boundary. And I actually had that question too. So are we considering that, or you mentioned it was a quest, and certainly it is. But uh, yeah, I, I think we'll bring. Was, you know, we'll we'll evaluate the cost for doing okay. something like that and bring it to you. It'll definitely be a board action. Um, it's not a cheap fence to build. Sure. Um, but it would it would increase security, of course. Um, you know, there's plenty of good things about it other than the cost. Right. Um, so we can we can see how that fits into our budget. I would like to see it brought to us to see what it would cost. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll take a stab at that when things settle okay. down a little. 
Sure. Thank In you. terms Likewise. of the Capitola ordinances, is a 10-foot fence wall like that legal? We're in the county. We're in the county. Uh, here. We're in the county, and you can get a over height permit for something like that, especially if it's driven by you know the neighborhood and there's support for it. Uh -huh. um, I think we can get at least an eight foot fence with an over height, maybe a ten at the most. Okay, thank you. O and M. Um, I don't have anything to add if you guys have any questions on this. <coughs> any questions? No. I have one. What's the status of the ammonia in our well? Um, well, the well's been off since October yeah. um, after we installed the packers to try and um, pack her off uh, sort of the middle of the well, and that uh, didn't work. Um, we just got a proposal in from the company that um, did the depth discrete study and also design the packer um, the next thing we want to try is to uh, lower the lower packer um, to get the lower producing screen further away from the zone that's suspected to have the higher ammonia and um, put a, 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 a suction an engineered suction so the pump is actually pulling from even lower than that area um, <coughs> and we're also possibly going to have another packer in there so we could completely block off the lower zone. However, we would be just then pulling from the upper zones with higher iron and manganese, and there might be some other issues with that from just having basically a shallow well. So um, we're looking at that option before we uh, are going into treatment options. We um, have solicited some qualifications from some engineering firms that we can go to next if this next try does not work. Thanks. Because I'm, I'm glad to see we're still working on it because that was quite an investment we oh, made. Oh, yeah. No, well. Well, we're, okay. we want that well back. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. What's next? Uh, some special projects. Do you want to yes. take that? <coughs> I'll cover that. So a couple things. Uh, I'll report out that uh, Melanie Mal Schumacher, Director Christensen, and myself uh, toured the Padre Dam Advanced Purification Facility uh, at the end, um, the end of November. There, it was quite informative to see what they have going on. But a, a full system um, pilot system running there. Future plans. I'd like to also note that the sign up um, for the Counter California Water Reuse <coughs> Conference. Uh, that's held in May, uh, March 25th through the 28th, and it's down here in Monterey. Uh, we, if, if you're planning to go, please let uh, us know because if, you, if we sign you up before the 29th, get the discount, and we like the discount. So thank you on that. Uh, let me see. Uh, in front of you right there, you can just see a couple of the ads. I know not a chance to see everything that flies by these are in various papers that sign in the middle is actually hanging out in front of our um, facility there on soquel i think it's a nice sign and then um lastly go to the end of this report um connecting the drop yeah connecting the drops here's the agenda for that february 1st at uh, new brighton middle school and you can see that uh, it'll give the public a chance to uh, tour different uh, stations there. There's a, um, I think that's, yeah, and then there's some presentations by each of the uh, groundwater sustainability agencies. So just want to make people aware of that. That's all I have. Any questions on, on this? No. Nope. What's the uh, presentation on January 25th to the Capitol City Council about? Yeah, that's just going to be, uh, just talk to uh, their, um, city manager uh, today. They, it's about a 10 minute update just where we are on our community water plan and our various projects. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be held at the beginning of the meeting. It's, um, when they put you at the beginning, it's more of a, just a quick delivery, 10 minutes or less. And they usually don't like uh, ask too many questions, that sort of thing. But you know, because we do supply them water, the vast majority of their water supply comes from us. Uh, they like to keep in touch with, you know, how we're doing on securing a supplemental supply. Okay. Thank you. Let's see what's next. Finance. 
So Ron has already mentioned that we have a finance committee meeting on Monday at four o'clock at the district office. And then I also want to point out that um, bond disclosure requirements necessitate us publishing our financials on the uh, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board uh, data port website. So that's all been taken care of. Our, our financials are available publicly to our investors at this point. Any questions? Human resources? Um, nothing much to add to the items on the report. Um, there was some uh, feedback on the item that was listed for the January 10th joint hearing that was scheduled at the state legislature regarding CalPERS retirement funds. I didn't have a chance to read up on that today with my schedule, so um, I don't have a report out on, on exactly what happened with that meeting. Um, but um, CalPERS website is really good at providing information um, on updates. The other thing that's not included in this report, I have sent out notice to our um, board of directors as well as all of our employees, and we're proud to participate with um, the other local water agencies in the county for a Santa Cruz Warriors um, night for local water agency staff. And so um, everyone uh, with all of the local water agencies in the county of Santa Cruz are invited to attend um, the Santa Cruz Warriors game on January 31st. And so if anyone's interested, we get to go have a good time with our brethren um, and purchase tickets to do that. So um, you're welcome as well. Thank you. Any questions? I already got tickets. <laughs> <laughs> really? General Manager, please. Yeah, so I'll report out three things in, in uh, my section here. Number one is the Monterey Bay Community Power Update. Uh, I think that Director LeHue asked us to investigate um, for them to come back with what options are available um, regarding that um, service. And as you can see, just a little bit, let me arrow down here. They're, they are um, at the point where they have various options there, but we believe there, and let me go back. So one is we take the 3% rebate and can just keep it, use it for our own needs. The other one is direct that 3% rebate uh, back toward uh, renewable energy resources, uh, and I believe those are local ones. And then the, uh, la uh, the third one there is uh, direct that 3%, which is the rebate they're gonna give us um, if we're enrolled, which we, we will be unless we opt out, uh, direct that back toward uh, low income. But I had conversations with Bob Basso, and you may want to, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I really think you're limited to number one. Because mm -hmm. number two and three, you're really giving district funds to some other entity. Yeah, right, yeah. But I, but I will say, when I reached out to the um, agency here, uh, I said, you know, I had an inkling of that, and that's why we reached out to Bob and, and Leslie here. And, they, and they're just, they're, they're just trying to get this pro, this, agency going in program, so they, they were soliciting input, so hey, if you run any roadblocks, come back to us. So we'll be thinking about if there's any other way to arrange it or if there's anything else we can do and provide them any uh, more direction that might work better for them did, and us. Did they have a date? A date of when? When they're gonna make the switch over? Uh, yeah, it's in March. It's like March, automatically you switch yeah. in, everybody's I think, in. I think February for residential and then Commercial is in July, if I remember right. But I was at a Scotts Valley Water District meeting the other night, and they pretty much acknowledged that two and two and three are not available okay. to public aid agencies. Yeah. But private individuals could choose to do that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know that when we've looked at EIR issues in the past, we have thought about you know doing some local investment in carbon-free stuff mm -hmm. to get that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, does the first one? obviate any of those responsibilities because we might have we could use that to perhaps satisfy eir constraints so we, we could do that i don't think there's any problem with that investing that in the and the good that would be distributed amongst our all our customers yes yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so that's definitely an option and like i said they're just getting on their feet and and so i'm sure it'll evolve a little bit okay and then number two i just want to point out this uh special districts leadership academy conference uh, the California Special District uh, Association, CSDA, you know, offers a range of things uh, really centered around governance as opposed to aqua or something like that, that or uh, water reuse, which is more technical or uh, politically focused. 
This is just more around governance and just wanted to put it out there. I actually took this program maybe like eight years ago and they've morphed it and I think uh, probably done a, uh, even enhanced it. I take some of their other programs and think they get you know pretty much to the point. So if you go on that link, you'll see different sites. I think the next one's in Monterey and then up in Napa and I forget where it is next after that. So I just want to put that out there. And then the third item there is Wichita Falls, Texas, their indirect potable reuse project. They're just about ready to um, uh, pull the switch on that and, and get it cranking where they uh, purify water and send it up to a reservoir and use it. And uh, I think the article's linked there, yeah. Uh, what was interesting is, you know, when they interviewed the uh, public works director, he said, this is nothing new. It's, it's been done in w Wichita before. And what he's talking about, how treated water has been uh, put in a river and then used downstream. So um, just thought it was worth noting there. Any other questions? Okay, it's time for the public to give us their input on these items. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I have a question on the engineering report um, on page 47 it, where it talks about the Granite Way well. It mentions civil improvements pending pg e service. Um, and construction scheduled for spring of 2018. I'd like to know what civil improvements involve and um, also to ask if there um, has ever been any testing of any of the water there from that well, including the panel of contaminants that were found in the contamination plume related to the um, underground storage tank in Aptos Village Project it was recommended to your district by um, Mr. Tim Fillmore from Hazardous Materials at County Environmental Health Services that you do test for that panel. I know that I have seen tests of panel contaminants related to dry cleaning contaminants, but they did not include the contaminant panel um, that, that were found in the, in the uh, contaminated soils of that tank. Thank you. I'd like a, an answer if I could, please. Well, I don't know what the staff wants to say, but any time we put a well online, we have to do a full set of tests and you know, we have to submit those tests and they would certainly include dry cleaner fluids, they would certainly include hydrocarbons, which are usually what's in these tanks. And so we would have to test it and get it purified to, to that regard. Um, I don't know if the staff has anything they want to add, but I, before we put it online, we'd have to do you know, all those tests. So. Yeah, and there's soil borings done, or soil testing. Usually what they do when they detect something like that in the soil, they, they test, they find it, they scoop it out, and they keep testing till there's no more left there. And if it, it does continue down far, sometimes they'll require you to test that in the water also. Right. That, that's what the county would have to do, but right. we right, also right, have to test county, our water. Right. Just in general, that's what's required in a situation right. like that. Okay, so anyone else? Um, uh, my name is Bria Steinbrenner. I was wondering about the um, the Arrowhead water or lake thing. Um, two questions, actually. So is the water that goes into the creek um, the um, same water that comes out of the um, the treatment plants, like uh, the one you're planning to put in in um, the your district? Like the, is it treated to the, to where it's clear? I think she's asking if it's purified. I think, yeah, yeah. If, 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 it's, if it's secondary yeah, so it's trees. A, I can no. give you a quick, yeah. it's just, I was just gonna say, there's two in that whole paragraph. There's mm -hmm. one where the water's gonna be treated to the same level of treatment. It's really, you know, it's reverse osmosis, microfiltration, mm -hmm. and that's very purified water. Yeah. They mentioned at the end of the, he mentions at the end of the paragraph that for years what's gone on is just typical wastewater treatment that's oh, gone okay. into a river and then has flowed downstream into the next communities water supply. So oh. that's not something new, that's just kind of explaining the way things have gone if you live oh, along okay. a river and that's where you get your water. Oh, You're getting okay. somebody's upstream wastewater mm -hmm. that happened, mm -hmm. I forget what the word they used um, in the NWRI conference, they had a name for that, um, but I can't remember the name yeah. for it. Or like uh, accidental reuse. Uh, uh, or just, oh. I mean the Mississippi River is famous for that because yeah, all around it goes the from city so to city to so city. So, to so city. two separate things there. Yeah. The oh, new okay. thing is gonna be 
very purified water added to a reservoir. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Ooh, sorry. Sorry, so short. Uh, my name's Jane Paradise. I live on Rosedale Avenue. And you were mentioning the letter from the neighbor on Gary Drive, which is on the southern side. And his letter is expressing other complaints that we, other neighbors, have been giving to the district for a while. Um, and so I um, want to add that um, to his request, not only the southern border, border, but your request for a bid for a wall to um, not only the south, but also the east, which affects Rosedale. Um, because what's happened is on Rosedale, you demolished a house and some um, natural foliage, all of which were sound barriers for many years. I lived there for over 30 years. And your, um, the noise and the vibrations um, have, you know, are exceeding your boundary lines, which traditional commercial uses, you know, like you're essentially have been growing and are more of a construction yard now, a lot of noise and vibration, and any other commercial um, enterprise like that has a requirement that your sound and vibration should not exceed your boundaries. So, um, you know, it's so what I'm, not only the eastern side, I'm guessing people on Capitola Avenue feel the same way. So I'm rec suggesting, requesting that you please, in this bid, that it be something equivalent to a stucco wall or something, um, your level of uh, use of your property um, to, because we are in the middle of a residentially zoned area and you would be required to contain that noise and vibration within those boundary lines. And we've complained about this about a year ago. We were assured you would address it and it still hasn't happened yet. No foliage was planted. Um, so I look forward that not only rose, you know, the eastern side, but I'm guessing also add the west. So essentially your property should have a substantial, um, the tall, tallest and thickest wall to contain all the noise and vibrations that your operations uh, turned into. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Now we move on to <coughs> the administrative business. So I am, oh wait, sorry, District, District Council, you're right. Just a short follow up on what Shelley was talking about. <laughs> Ron actually got a notice from CSDA about this Wiskowski's latest bill, sent it to me. I call, I immediately contacted Aqua who said, first we've heard about it. Um, but they then followed up on it and contacted me and asked if I would join in a, a conference call with a staffer from the Senator's office. That hasn't happened yet. But I did agree to do that because I think they need to realize that at least in this county, an ADU could be 1,200 square feet, which is bigger than some houses, and that's a substantial addition to the water district, and then the question becomes, if you can't have WDO fees, what's the alternative, which is perhaps a moratorium that's been looked at in the past. Mm -hmm. So I think they need to recognize that. One of the things well, that, to point that out to them. I will. One of the things that got to me is it says, shall not be subject to impact fees, connection fees, capacity charges, or any other fees levied by those entities. So you might even think that, you know, fees for, for water use uh, could, so, someone's gonna claim that, you know, I get free water uh, perhaps yeah, yeah. out of that. And so it's very broad. Yeah, and other agencies, while they don't charge uh, a new connection fee, mm -hmm. do do a fixture count mm -hmm. to see how many new additional fixtures will be added. And that may require a different size meter. And this is basically saying can't do that either. Right. So it's a very broad bill. It doesn't really recognize all of its implications, and I hope to point that out to them. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Now we go to item 6.1. I think this is yours, Tracy. 
we at the district um, are very proud that we have a great community of support and uh, tonight uh, we would like to recognize several members of our community who um, have stepped in and voluntarily um, uh, opted to help us out in our processes and so the board tonight will be presenting resolutions in appreciation for several community members and I would like to go ahead and have uh, Dr. Daniels um, read our first resolution for our first uh, community member. Well first I'm going to read what staff has written about you know the committee and some of these individuals. Uh, so standing committees play an important role in our organization by assisting and or advising the board, developing recommendations and providing oversight and transparency in the district's business practices. Customer participation on these committees provides great added value to the process and the outcome. So our first awardee is Larry Freeman and they say he's above and beyond involvement as he attends our board meetings, periodically emails staff and who gave us the heads up that the, grant, the guideline changes were being proposed for the Prop 1 groundwater grant. So thank you, Larry. And number two, Kenneth Gerard, Finance Committee, and they say he's experienced with water agencies and provided valuable contributions, especially around finance and infrastructure issues. And third, Adele Gardner is passionate to get information out to the community members, and that's very important to us as well. So. These three individuals have come forward. We have some. Uh, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Yeah, let's vote on this first. <laughs> <laughs> so these three things. Let's do the first three. I'll move approval of all four, though. All four. Okay. Second. There should be a public comment opportunity. Okay. Well, if anyone wants to get up and complain about this, this is the time. <laughs> Seeing nobody. Uh, roll call. Director Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Jaffe. Definitely yes. Mm -hmm. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Daniel. Absolutely yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Three individuals, please come up. I think only two of them are here today. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could get the board president to come out and, and, and we could get her. Yeah, yeah, especially if Rick would like to do it. You want to do it here? Yeah, we'll look at it. <laughs> <laughs> And then at the end, we'll get a, we'll get a picture in, with the entire board. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad I wore makeup. Uh, Larry Freeman is a customer of the Soap Creek Water District. Larry, Mr. Freeman was appointed by the board in April 2016 as a voluntary community, community, community member to the Board of Soap and Water Supply Committee. And where Mr. Freeman is committed to local and statewide water issues, choosing the volunteer's time to attend meetings on a bi monthly basis, and providing insight and valuable input to the board and system of water supply standing committee, renamed in December 2017 to Water Research and Management Committee. And where Mr. Freeman offers a valued voice to the so called Creek Water District in the review of the district supplemental supply issues, including components of the community water. A true commitment to the Soquel Creek Water District, as he also frequently attends district board meetings. Now, therefore, be it resolved, we all join in extending our sincere appreciation for his service as a community member. Thank you very much. Whereas Adele Gardner is a customer of the Soquel Creek Water District, and whereas Ms. Gardner was appointed by the board in April 2016 as a voluntary community committee member to the board's public outreach standing committee, and whereas Ms. Gardner has committed to volunteering her time to attend meetings on a bi-monthly basis and provide insight and valuable input to the board's public outreach standing committee, and whereas Ms. Gardner is passionate to get information out to the community members and offers a valued voice to the Soquel Creek Water District Public Outreach Committee on issues, design ideas, and planning, and whereas Ms. Gardner has demonstrated a true commitment to the Soquel Creek Water District. Now, therefore, be it resolved, we all join in our sincere appreciation for her service as committee member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
But we're not done yet. We have a, uh, we, one of the, f the fourth motion we did was the resolution appreciation of the members of the Water Rates Advisory Committee. And as I understand, tonight we have John McCoy, Nancy Trevino, John Dickinson, Chris France, Wanda Williams, Joe Martinez, and Hans Sherman here, or at least that's what I was told. So would they please come forward? And anyone else who I forgot to mention? Over there is the the cameras don't go over there. No. Uh, oh, he's, 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 they're all the same. We're as members of the district water rates advisory committee are customers of the Swift Water District, and we're as members applied for and were appointed in May 2017 as voluntary community committee members to the board and ad hoc. Water Rates Committee, and whereas members committed to volunteering their time to attend meetings to evaluate what provide recommendations on new district rate structure, and whereas members offer an important voice to the Soco Creek Water District and provide input on the district's upcoming rate study, and whereas members have demonstrated a commitment to the Soco Creek Water District, now therefore, be it resolved, we all join in extending our sincere appreciation for service as community volunteers they're, they're up on top and all names are together. So each one of them gets one. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> And a little bit later, we're going to expand this service, too, because we think it's so valuable, we want to do more of it, so. Okay, item 6.2 is some water demand offset. Wilson's letters. Hello again. Uh, the first one is similar to a, a project you saw um, in the fall of last year where the water demand offset program does not apply until within a certain three year uh, period. I don't know if you recall making that policy, um, but this is another one of those lots that had a subdivision report, public report. And uh, so they need to move through the process before uh, next January, and then they can qualify for that exemption. The second one is uh, just down the street, right, right across the street, actually. Um, it's a commercial retail storefront with a home behind it, and they're planning to um, take down the house and build a duplex, and the retail space will stay the same. Any questions on this? Okay. And, and they did, I'm sorry, that was conditioned on them paying the fee, and they did pay today, this morning. Okay. Oh, that's right. I will move the first one, item 621. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
I'll, I'll move approval of the second one. I'll second. 6.2.2. Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I oppose. Okay. Thank you. Item 6.3, approval selection of the ERP vendor software. So back in uh, spring of last year, we undertook a, a project to start looking at a new ERP system to replace our Springbrook system because it's no longer receiving the customer support through Excella that it used to. So what we, what we did is we formed an ERP project selection team that included people from all different departments that are impacted by this software. And what we discovered as we went through this process is that first we really needed to get some idea of the scope um, of what we wanted to see in a new system. And so before we could do an RFP, we really needed to go out there and take a look at some of the systems to do some demonstrations and see what they all had to offer. And through that process, what we found out is we actually did kind of do the steps for a, a, a RFP selection process, but we did it without having a formal RFP in place. So we took a look at a number of systems. We eliminated those that weren't gonna provide the enhanced functionality we were looking for. And we winnowed it down to where we only had about two viable options. And so the ERP selection committee sat down and met and there was very clearly a front runner in that process. And that front runner was Tyler Encode um, Software Systems. And so we're making the recommendation tonight, especially since Tyler Encode or Tyler Technologies is part of the National um, Joint Powers Alliance for uh, uh, Government Purchasing Contracts, to go ahead and um, approve us to pursue um, a contract with them for their ERP software solution. Any questions? I had one question. It looks like we're spending $100,000 that we haven't budgeted yet because it's 2018, 2019, is that? We, had, we had split it in the budget. There were two fiscal years and we had split it between the two fiscal years. So we had a budget for 2017, 18, and then we had a proposed or forecasted budget for 2018, 19, because we didn't expect that we would be able to purchase software and get it implemented in the same fiscal year. So you're correct, we only appropriated part of that for 2017, 18. We have to do something special to allow us to now purchase it, because it's still we, we should We shouldn't incur any additional costs beyond that until we get to the implementation phase, which will actually be in 2018, 19. So it'd be similar to any sort of uh, public works contract that we engage in. We budget for the work we expect to get done this year. I see, okay, thanks. Anything else? I'll make the motion. Why is it public comment? Oh yeah, public, yeah. Public comment? Seeing none? All right, now I'll make the motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Let's see, do we need to uh, just vote on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Actually, it was two motions, wasn't it? Yeah. Make the motion, I sorry. Are you making motion Both, number yeah. two? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we can make two motions then. At the same time. Oh, okay. I see. What? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we go to item 6.4, the rate analysis. So tonight we have both Sanjay Gower and Kevin Kostiak from uh, Raftelis Consultants, and you've met with them before. Um, we had a workshop back in December where they presented their preliminary recommendations on the customer select. Um, rate option and they are here this evening to go ahead and present their final report on that on that uh, effort. Thank you, Leslie. President, board members, staff, and public I'd like to present our presentation associated with customer select. And um, so at, this is a summary presentation that I presented before. We've also developed a, rec, a report that summarized this, um, and I've, if you have any questions throughout my presentation, please let me know and we can clarify. So as you know, the study objective was to facilitate workshop with the rate um, advisory committee and with the board to examine alternative rate structure, customer select, to see if it makes sense for the district. Um, we also evaluated different policy options associated with that to guide us in that decision-making process. We used what we call a pricing objective 
where we asked ourselves what are the most important, we asked you specifically and the advisory committee, what are your most important concerns? Based on those current concerns, we can determine which are the policies that we should develop and prepare a recommendation and a framework for taking it to the next step, which would be then if desired by the board to develop actual rates. So uh, the process, um, we had a series of workshops. Um, as you can see, this was actually a pretty aggressive schedule. We started end of this October with the first um, kickoff meeting and advisory. Um, we went through a series of workshop with advisory and with the board and we developed a report. Um, and then today's the last day of, for this um, part of the study. As you know, you are a fixed cost business. Your 97% of your cost is fixed. The 3% of your cost is variable. This is um, for, in the water community, it's normal for agencies to be a high fixed cost. Those agencies that don't have such a high fixed cost is because they usually have some imported water. Still, their fixed cost is relatively high, up to um, 80%. Some of them might be even a little bit lower. Now with the variable section, as you can see, you collect most of your, your revenue on the variable. So there's a mismatch here. As we know, this is a problematic during drought conditions where revenues fall if the costs do not. Why have we historically done this? It's because we view water as a commodity. Um, uh, we've, and there's uh, many reasons why we do that. One of the main reasons we do that is, is that for conservation efforts. We're telling people water is scarce, it's a commodity, please use less of it, it's a scarce resource. Now, the challenge with that is that 67% of our revenue is from the commodity and only 3% of our cost is variable. And so now there's, because of that disconnect and because of sa drop in sales um, and the cost still remaining the same, there's a dialogue in the community, in the water community, to trying to change it from being saying, hey, we're not a commodity, we're actually a service. And the idea is here is, is that we're telling customers that there's a hidden cost here, or significant hidden cost, which is the ability to use water. Even though we're, none of us are at our homes right now, there's a cost there. 24 hours, seven days a week, and we need to somehow capture that cost. What historically agencies have done in, the, in California is try to increase the fixed charge, but by doing that, try to increase the meter charge, affordability, conservation messages are sort of thrown out the window in an in, in, in attempt for revenue stability. Customer select now is an attribute where a, you can sort of hit a lot of different attributes. You can get the higher revenue, fixed costs, you can help with affordability potentially, and that's the one thing we need to examine more. And it also helps with conservation message because customers can lock into a higher program or, or in a higher program if they use more water. Now, another attribute of customer select is that it also can help if designed properly. It can design. It can be reflecting of the water system. Besides water being a fixed cost business, it's also a capacity business because really we designed the system for the hottest day plus fire. And the question is, is who needs that capacity? Who should pay for that capacity? And then and sort, of that's the, sort of the fundamentals of a cost of service analysis is allocating that cost. So with a customer select, we can actually attribute all that peaking to those customers who use the system and they are locked in to that in some sense by paying it. Um, the plan tier widths, the, pro, the plan itself can stabilize revenue. Um, and by having this sort of flat charge, no necessarily commodity charge, it also provides a conservation message now because if I'm in the higher plan, I'm gonna have to pay through that the whole year. So I have an incentive to try to get into a lower plan and have an actual saving throughout the whole year. So this is an illustration of the plan where we would have it in increments of two as actually um, suggested at the last board meeting to do 50 gallons. So you have plan A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, as you can see right over here. What we've done next is, is then we asked ourselves, what do we care about? What are our goals and objectives? Um, we did this through the advisory committee. We did this with the board. For me, what was very interesting was the alignment of these two and how similar the results are. Now, with the advisory committee, we didn't ask them some, we didn't ask one specific question, which is water resource management. Um, we did ask that for you. But as you can see, they are pretty much the same results. So I, I found that very interesting. So that means that you two are very much in sync in your thought process, which you never, don't necessarily see in a lot of other agencies we work with. 
Um, based on that, then we can come up with now what are the most important things, fair and equitable, defensibility, water resource management, and we can ask ourselves now what would make sense in order to design our program based on that. So fair and equitable, if we want to be truly fair and equitable, we should have a plan that has many programs, um, and it should be narrow so that we really target each individual needs. Also it helps with defensibility concerns that, um, with this program. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through each one of these. If you're interested, we can. If you have questions, as mentioned, we did talk about this last time I was here, and it's also in the report. Um, but I do want to hit the key objectives. First, fairness and equity. So that dictates many plans, tailored individual needs, defensibility. We want that narrow. My concern from Prop 218 perspective is to disconnect potentially with cap potential capacity and use, especially if the width of the plan are very large, so more narrow they are, then you're basically charging for that incremental capacity that they're using. Um, as um, directed, as, as I'll be mentioning earlier, later on in my presentation, 50 gallons was sort of the benchmark we decided on, which sounds like a great number to use. Um, so that will help us with that. So the outcome is to have many narrow plans to meet both of these objectives. Also, with the advisory committee, we talked about this and about who should we roll this out with. What makes sense is to do this with residential customers if we were going to do this. Um, and the reason why is that their use and their meter sizes are similar. Um, there are some non residential customers that have large meters who just need that. It's basically a standby. So they may not use any water but they want to have that large meter for insurance purposes. For instance, um, Cabrillo College and Seacliff Golf Course, they basically are using groundwater or they have wells, from my understanding. If, if, miss, if I miss say something, please correct me. Um, so these individuals have large meters just for insurance reasons. So it doesn't make sense. They don't really fit into this model that we're talking about with customer select, residential dough. So that's our recommendation there. Um, open enrollment was something that we definitely hear loud and clear. We need to have that um, for our customers. Um, what we're recommending is to have that as a rolling um, plan. Um, right now, you know, one of the things that needs to be determined in the second phase is how often does that occur? Does that happen six, 12? So the, the goal of this study, from my viewpoint, was is to narrow this down. So just to have a couple of policy options on the table for modeling purposes. Because if we have too many things to model, it gets a little bit sort of crazy. <laughs> so we want to narrow the scope here and sort of understand, okay, what are the two or three policy options we want to really understand and evaluate? So that's one we heard, open enrollment. What does that mean? And we want to have a rolling enrollment. So not, not everyone calls in at the same time, but different um, accounts can call in. If I'm going too fast, let me know. I feel like we've covered this. I'm moving relatively at a quick pace. Um, the other one that we talked about is um, adjustments and when should that occur? Sh you know, do we have um, basically penalties? You know, we talked a bit about you know how can we do that with cost of service? For us, the the simplest thing is is that if people use more water, they just automatically get bumped into the next plan. Um, that basically then reflects the cost of service analysis. It's a clean story. It also helps with administrative costs too. Um, credit associated with individuals who then go under their plan. There are some savings that the agency does occur from less groundwater extraction associated with electricity and, and um, um, treatment. So we should take that into account. What we're recommending is that that credit basically occurs at the end of the year and it's a credit on their bill and the true up. And that analysis of how much that should be will need to be determined. But basically tying it to the groundwater production. We did hear comments from people about maybe looking at other things. So we will look at other options there. But the groundwater is definitely um, easy to do and, and should be uh, attributed to the customers. Other considerations is um, what happens if one of the comments we heard at the prior board meetings is, you know, my sprinkler system went off. Do I get ding for the whole year? What if um, some other things occur, medical, whatever? So we need to have a variance and appeal process if we're going to roll this out. That needs to be very clear and articulated about what are exempt and what are not exempt and how do you sort of approve your cause. So that needs to be sort of evaluated and determined. We're just giving you some examples, medical devices, leak adjustments, establishing landscaping. We're not saying 
that you should get a variance for that, but they should be evaluated and the board should t direct us on which one. Plan selection, um, customers can make their individual selection. If no selection is made, then it's basically based on the prior month's use of that billing cycle, basically. They'll just automatically be in that pl um, program, in that plan. And then as um, basically, um, and then the plan will auto adjust as they actually use more and more water. Units of measurements as directed um, by the board, we're suggesting 50 gallons. And so that's a great in, in, uh, input we got. Um, and then the billing units will remain in uh, um, um, 100 cubic feet or CF. Um, we'll still need to figure that out, but we can do either one. So next steps is really what I heard at the last board meeting is the refinement options associated with peak use. Is that a 12 month period? Is, how do we find peak first? You know, is it the highest month used? Is it the average of maybe two or three months? So those are things that we can model and evaluate and see what customer impacts are associated with that. Second one is, is when do you roll off that peak? Is it a year? Is it six months? So again, those are things that we can model and those are very concrete um, things, especially with the database um, if, the, if directed by the board. Um, and then basically develop rates and impacts. So that would be the next step of the study if desired by the board. And that's my presentation. Okay. So I don't know if there's any questions or comments. Oh, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> questions? Well, I just want to make clear. So the things that you would want, if we, if we decide to proceed, the things you want us to decide is like, one, how to define peak use, mm -hmm. and then um, how long these plans should run before they can change them. Are those the two main ones? Now, yes. And yeah, okay. That's the, those are to me the two major policy drivers of this. And then typically people use less water in the fall, winter, and more in the spring, summer. So this, you know, the, I think the analogy with this type of plan is a, is a, a phone, you know, mm -hmm. mobile phone plan and people don't make more calls and I don't know. I don't suspect they make more calls in, in any one particular season than another. Christmas time. Yeah. Christmas time, yeah. maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, or on, on VK, who knows. But the, so there's that disconnect there. So how did, what, what's your proposed way of uh, solving that? Well, it's, this isn't, I wouldn't call it um, a solution. I would call it options in the sense of what are the pros and cons of different ways of doing it. And so some of the things that we, will be exa we, we may discover, for instance, and this is how hypothetical, but because we haven't done the analysis, but is that you may see a situation where certain customers may see a significant increase in the bill, such as people who are um, renting the house um, for the summertime and they're not there in the wintertime or secondary homes, those individuals may see a significant increase. And then other customers may see a decrease, but the decrease may be only, let's say, 50 cents or a dollar, while someone else may see a $100 increase. And, mm. and so while it may be fair and equitable to do that, is it, I mean, it, it, while it might be defensible, excuse me, to do that, is it fair to do that? And that's where you know, the board's input would need to be put in and so there's some nuances there where we need to understand what, what do we think is fair. And while all these options I'll be presenting will be defensible, there's, you know, fairness is sort of where I will need your input. Gotcha. Would it, would it be possible to have a, a plan that has a, you know, fall, winter use and a spring, summer use? Like the, where you just, I don't know what, what it would be, whether it be you know twice the use in the summer, spring, summer. As we get more and more individualized to the seasons, it becomes more and more similar to your current rate structure. So that's one of the caveats to think about. And, and I, I think once we do the analysis and we show you, if we do the analysis, I should say, you know, then you'll see, you could see this. But more and more your your like your current rate structure you could say is a plan but it's each month <laughs> you use it and you you're in the tiers and that's what you pay and then you decide which plan and you roll off and on so you're not tied to your historical use mm. 
What, what I anticipate as we go through this modeling process and we start actually assigning, for, first it will start with a finance plan and then we start assigning actual numbers to these plans and dollar amounts, et cetera. I think that's gonna bring up a, 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 a number of other policy decisions that have to be made along the way. Um, so I, I, I see this as kind of an ongoing process as we start to model it and get more information. Any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering who was gonna develop that, the rate plan, but to figure out, I mean, big question I have is how could we keep a stable income so that we could predictably budget for a year? Right, and that that's actually our next step. So I think what we'll be doing um, is we'll be agendizing that for our finance committee meeting next week, and we'll be talking about what our next steps are and how we move forward. So. Uh, Go ahead. Are one of the options, is one of the, is one option going to be looking at the, the fixed rate being, let's say, 60% and then monthly just changing according to your use as we're already doing, but it's flipped I th right I now. think the plan that we've been looking at in terms of customer select is that entire plan is fixed. Right. And then we were going to be What's looking at difference? that model in conjunction with our tiered rate model, which would be a low fixed charge and then the tiered volumetric charge. Is it possible to look at if we just made it fixed, let's say 60% and or 70%, whatever it is, and any rate see what consult the difference would be? Yeah, any rate consultant should be able to do that. Just as one of the, yeah. so we can compare. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're looking at winter water use and summer water use. Mm -hmm. and of course, I came from the sewer business, so we only looked at winter water use. And it was typically um, winter and spring, and usually it's fall and summer where you have more water use. And so I'm just wondering, you know, it's going to jump up. So what's the difference? Yeah, so any rate consultant should be able to do that analysis. We should be able to create a model that can look at different scenarios associated with a fixed charge and and the swing between fixed and variable. We, we haven't included that option that you're talking about. It's been thought about before, the, and, and maybe the board wants to look at that, but the, if, if you go, let's say, 70% fixed, which, would, which Leslie would love because your income is, is fairly fixed, mm -hmm. it the the and they all have pluses and minuses but um then uh everybody even the low water users are paying that high uh, or higher fixed thing and so that's the drawback to that model certainly been looked at and it, and it would be in alignment with the way our fees are and our fixed costs and our operational costs but um because of that uh, factor that it, you know the low users wouldn't they would be you know, in the category with everybody with that 70% fixed fee and uh, not as encouraging on generally in, in general on conservation. conservation. Yeah, I realize that. I just, um, I mean, if it was only a $10 difference and this is easier to do, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's the only reason I would even ask. I wouldn't consider it to be a choice, but just a comparison. Mm -hmm. There's some input about peak. Um, is that a question? No, I'm giving some input. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's open up to the public okay. hearing. Then, okay. I have one question first, though, which is about defensibility. Uh, as you know, we have gone from the hundred cubic feet, you know, 758 acres, 750 gallon, down to about seven gallons. So people are really paying for just ex almost exactly what they're using now, and we are intending to go to this much bigger unit, so if you're using you know, 2.1 units and yet you're getting charged for four, isn't that a Prop 218 problem for us that you know, someone could point out and say, but I'm, I use 2.1, but you're charging me for four units. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, but that's why you've got a very, you're talking about very narrow yes. bands. I mean, the, the broader the band, the worse that problem is. You know, the band goes from two to four, as, right. as being proposed. So right. you could be using 2.1, and 
and you're being charged for four. So I'm wondering. But you could also use 3.9 and be charged. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's going with them. You're, you're getting crazy. charged. I mean, realistically, you're probably getting charged for three. Yeah. Okay. And I think the customer select rec uh, recommendation that Sanjay had made was that um, that credit at the end of the year was for your unused. So that would be the defense then. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. That's a good point. All right. Let's open it up. Anyone who wishes to address us on this item, this is your time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I, I have some questions. Um, the first one has to do with, um, I remember hearing this plan first explained to the rate advisory committee, and there was some staff concern, I think it was Ms. Flock actually, that was very concerned about the credit part of this whole picture, if the district could really um, support um, providing credits for people who had over essentially overpaid more than their plan. So I would like to know how that would be factored in and if that uh, staff concern has been addressed. I think it's a good concern. Um, my second question is um, when, how often does the district reevaluate the actual cost of service and the cost to produce this? the water um, in light of the Monterey Bay Power Consortium coming in and, and saying that the rates are going to be um, lowered um, and that is probably one of the district's largest expenses, power. Um, how often does the district reevaluate its cost for uh, establishing rate bases and the cost of providing the service? And to that end, um, I, I don't know if the district is still buying water or receiving water from Central Water District, but last month you were, and a substantial amount, and their cost that they charge you is substantially lower than what you charge your customers for it. So I think it needs to be, that needs to be addressed, because then essentially the cost of the water that you're providing your customers is lower than what it would cost you to do, but that needs to be handled fairly and equitably. And then um, the last um, question is regarding Cabrillo College. I seem to remember in some Public Records Act request information that the lower campus, the, the newer part of the campus is on your district, or there were some questions in the literature about water demand offsets and if they would have to um, meet those requirements. They seem surprised by them. So I would like that point clarified about how much, if any, of the Carrillo College is on the district. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'll close the public input. Do you wish to address any of these? It, I, I was just going to say that anytime you have a rate change, those have to be evaluated really carefully for what the actual costs are. I mean, that's the whole idea. It's, it's a not-for-profit organization, and, and, so the, and it has to be done fairly. And also, the, even though power is a large part of the bill, it doesn't, we still only have, a, as you said, a 3% variability, and that's, where, that's one of the things that varies. In fact, as was mentioned, the fixed costs are 97%. Right. So. We may get water from Central a little bit cheaper than pumping it out of the ground, I doubt it. But uh, even it's if we did, it, it's, it's down in the you know pennies uh, range. So, And we actually do reevaluate our costs every year because that's when we do our budget every year because we look at everything we're spending money on. And, uh, so things do change from one year to the next. And if something g goes up, uh, something else has to go down to keep it flat. Either that or we have to go about and redo our rates again, which we try not to do very frequently, but we do it every few years. So. Um, as far as the, the one thing he wanted to have us give guidance on if we're going to pursue this is defining peak use. And I looked at those two and just my first take was that just one month might not be a good idea to define peak use, that maybe an average of two or three months would be more reasonable, but I wanted to throw it open. 
because we need to come up with yeah. some guidance too. Well, I think partly it's the individual PQs and then the district-wide PQs. I mean, you can use. Somebody mean for defining their. Yeah. Their cost. Their cost. I guess if the range between the peaks, let's say from winter to summer, is 50 gallons, let's say <laughs> per person, then you could see what. It should I'm be talking about a, giving, using, yeah. defining a peak. Is like is always going to usually going to be in the mm -hmm. summertime. So just defining that by a couple month average versus just one month. I don't know. We had also, I think, talked a little bit about um, a variance that would allow somebody, after a few months of reducing their water use, to drop back down to a lower program. So there were a number of options. I think that we were considering. Well, if it, so I, the logic is that if, if, um, if we can't serve people because there's too much demand, then we have to increase our system size in some way. Mm -hmm. And we have to, so our system is sized to, to meet that, that peak use. So, uh, you know, taking that to the absurd, you know, if everybody were to use their most water during the same time, then we'd have to have a extremely large system, yeah. capacity, you know, to serve. Plus that doesn't happen, thankfully, but it it probably happens a bit with the way things are phased. And like you say, in the summer, people are irrigating. Um, so I guess practically, Tom, I agree with you that you know the peak use isn't. Just any one instant, but okay. th there should be some, if if possible, there should be some way of accounting for for the strain on the system, mm -hmm. more than just a, a few month average of what they're using. So, I was just thinking that you know you just might have somebody randomly have a one month that was way out of line or something. Well, how would that happen? Well, know. leak is something we talked about. Well, that'd be a variance. If you, okay, yeah. that's true. So, but if we'll say like no, a summer full of kids home from college. <laughs> I mean, that's right. Something Fill up like a that. swimming pool. Swimming example. pool, it junk like that too. I mean, because this district is primarily, so far, customer uh, residential customers mainly, and so that's why we have such an extreme peak. Uh, one of the reasons ours is a residential peaking, so I think taking the three month, taking three months isn't a bad idea, but um, to average it out, but so I think you, there's a lot of questions built on this, mm -hmm. on this rate, this rate idea. Yeah. Even just having two months as the period is kind of nice because that means if you have a leak, that's not going to be a two month thing. It'll be one month a leak, and the next month they'll be back to normal. And similarly for we sometimes do see leaks that cross course, two months. That's why our, three our months or four months leak see. adjustment policy allows us to adjust across two, yes. two month period. Yeah, right. but still, a lot of these extraordinary things are you know one time events. Uh, we would still need to have a leak adjustment policy oh, yeah. in effect. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So let me see if I'm understanding this properly. So let's say. A customer, I'm going to use gallons instead of mm -hmm. units, uses 100 gallons um, 11 months out of the year and 500 gallons one month. What's, what's fair in terms of their rates? And where there's no lakes involved, this is just mm -hmm. their choice to irrigate, say, mm -hmm. during that one month. It, you know so the system it, has to be the system has to be designed to meet the 500 gallon peak. right yeah so you know I understand that if you then take that same customer and divide that 500 into three months you're now 700 divided by three which is what 233 gallons but the system still has to be able to meet that 500 so i 
I see what you're saying. Yeah. And it, and it could be that, you know, when they hit that 500, it could be that we have a policy that after three months of going back to 100, or two months of going back to 100, they can apply for a variance showing that our typical use is much lower than what we saw that one month, whether that one month was irrigation or whether it was unintentional. Yeah. Um, what, what I like about this is there's, and what I don't like also, is there's a, there's a, a there is an awareness of the customer about water use when they select their plan, and so that that can be a great thing because they, with awareness, become comes, you know, appreciation of the value of the resource, but it it could also be the pitfall of this whole thing if. People all are going, what happened, you know? Well, they're certainly going to become aware of their peaking. Um, um, I, I have a hunch a number of our customers don't realize how much more water they use in the summer than they do in the winter. Um, I think this type of program would point that out to them rather significantly and may, may change behaviors as a result. I don't know. And, and there is the issue, that, uh, this peaking behavior is both for the district a cost. I mean, if you look at the number of wells we have, the size of the wells, the number of pipes we have, the size of the pipes, the tanks, the dot, 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 almost all of our infrastructure is based on the peak use. And so right. it's a real cost. And so it is. charging people according to how much they're contributing to that peak is, is a sensible thing. And, and that's the focus on capacity. Right. right. And the other bit, we, we are, by doing this plan, we're losing some of our conservation focus. If you go from 2.1 units to 2.3 units now, you pay for that difference. With this plan, you won't pay it, it'll, it'll be the same cost. So there's not this, this impetus to keep moving you down. And you know, by, by putting you into this upper category, if you go over, uh, that, that is going to encourage you to keep your summer use down, which is, is the most, uh, the area where people can do the easiest work to save water is summer use. I mean, most of it just you know thrown out on the front lawn, and so I think that's something we want to keep. We, it's, a, it's a balance here. You know, we don't want to penalize them so that, you know they're out there with pitchforks, and it's it's unfair. But yet, some amount of penalization of you know summer use is a good thing because that is water that people could easily save in general, and uh, so. I think we want to keep some of that. So I think these ideas about, you know, some amount of the peak use would carry over for some number of months um, until it starts down again somehow uh, is a good thing because that's going to encourage people to, you know, not go crazy in the summer with their hose. Well, and if, if our open enrollment period were, say, January, um, then if you do hit, hit peak months in, in July, August, you're really not looking at that long a period before you can select Down again. a lower plan again. Um, it's not like you're having to pay 11 months at, at the peak use. You mean you're talking with a six month? It, well, if, if our enrollment period was in January and you just paid your lower plan, lower plan, and then all of a sudden in July you were to jump up, then it, if you didn't appeal a variance, you'd only be paying that peak through the latter half of the year before in January you could select a low plan again. Right, but we also talked about maybe having a shorter period than a year. Yeah, that was the other thing we need. Six months. So. Or no, she was talking about a year. Yeah, just, if it was a year. She's talking about a year. Just that that you would only be having to pay more if you got act bumped up into in the summer. Yeah. yeah, but we were originally talking about well, do we want to have the s s ability to switch plans yearly or less time? Well, in particular, if we're going to go to this, uh, you know, different people do it at different times of the year, then you would want to have some explicit uh, thing. And she's talking about an accidental thing. If you do right. it by calendar year and your peak use is in the summer, then you'd only get bumped up for the last mm -hmm. half of the year. And that's true. But if we want to do this rolling uh, period, then, then I think it needs to be some explicit uh, period, like six months or three months or four months or whatever. So I, I think these policy decisions are something that's going to need to be brought back to the board as the as this rate plan develops. Devils in the details. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 
I mean, I think I could see it uh, calling for a change on the leak adjustment. A whole lot of yeah, uh, it will. a lot of our policies that are already established. So it's it's a step by step. I think. Okay. So I mean, do we need to come to some kind of decision guidance? Just if you had any particular feedback that you wanted to provide at this point, at this point, it's just accept the report. I think at our last meeting, you you provided guidance that you would like us to go ahead and pursue this alongside our tiered rate structure to see how it develops. Yeah. So you're not making a hard and fast decision to go customer select at this point. I I would like to see considered the plan. Um, not being a set amount for the entire year, but being a different amount for winter and summer. So it'd be a, like plan A is say two to four, right, I'm gonna go back to gallons, 100 to, let's say 100 to 150 gallons during the, the fall, winter, and 300 gallons, um, during the spring summer, rather than it just be either 150 or 300 for the entire year. You know, the benefit of that I just thought of is just that people have to think about it twice a year and think, how much do I really need? Yeah. Or if I take my lawn out, maybe I don't need to go for the 300. Maybe I can go for the 200 or whatever. But the, your plan to talk about, you kind of automatically get more water in the summer, right? Yeah. But there's a like disadvantage that. to that. I don't that. like that because no, that's the disadvantage. That allows people to waste it if they want. And then remember, we're talking about capacity, peak capacity. Right. And that's always in the summer. Mm -hmm. We're providing that ability to have that. Well, that's something but, Taj computes every year is what, you know, what's our peak day and how much is but it? But you're paying for peak capacity during the winter when there isn't any strain on the mm -hmm. system. Right. I'm so. Well, only if you elect for a higher, a higher amount, you, know, you pre-select that. I mean, it, this is it is tending to be weak on conservation, and the ability to impose the peak capacity is a potential conservation tool for you know keeping water use in line with you know a more uniform yeah. basis. But how that how that will work, I don't. The best way for it to work for our district, I don't know right now. Could um, could we either have different automatic bumping and then allowing allowing them to opt to the lower a lower package in the fall or winter? I'm not sure. I'd like to well, I, I'm, see I'm the just, data on that. I'm just thinking if if we're going to allow people enrolling at all different times, which is practical because yes. new customers, et cetera. I want to enroll, and let's, if it's not for a full year period, if it's for a half year period, I want to enroll in, in the spring. And yeah. March and, and September. And pick my plan then for <laughs> summer peak, and then pick a different plan in, in the fall for my fall winter. Can I ask? Well, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I think I'd, you got a point. I mean, that's one problem with this rolling thing, is that then everyone's year is slightly different, and I think this, if we're going to have this rolling, it makes sense because having having this happen in January means everyone would be calling in the district in January to change. And, and I, that I suspect that we will get a portion of our customers that will monitor their bills and call in during an open enrollment period, and then we're going to have a portion of our customers that do not that just accept that a peak. large portion. Just that, just accept that peak and go with it. I yeah. And and what that and what that breaks out to be, I remains to be seen. No, I have one other question. I'm oh, sorry, your turn. Is it defensible to have winter water rates and summer water rates in one year and just say in the winter this is the rate per gallon, but in the summer it's a higher rate because of the cost for um, peaking? Yeah, so in order to, it, it's sort of what's the story or rationality behind it. So if our story or rationality is, is that we're talking about capacity, you know, that capacity is there all year round. It doesn't matter if it's winter or summer. You built a system for this day, and if people don't use it, it's idle capacity, it's called. Now, you can have rates that are go winter and summer. There are people who do that. So you can have winter and summer rates, 
but then the story is less about capacity. So it's sort of, you know, where do we, what's our logic with our rate structure? What's the rationality what, behind it? What is the logic for winter, summer? Different Usually rates? winter and summer rates are associated with different sources of supply. Gotcha. Is the one, I mean, you could argue right now that you do have summer, summer and winter rates by the tiers because people in the winter time tend to be in the lower tiers and in the summertime they tend to be in the higher tiers. So thus you see people's rates, their bills change between winter and summer. Mm -hmm. So one could argue that you do have a winter and summer rate with your tiered rate structure. But again, that's a choice of theirs. Correct. And you can certainly have flat usage, in which case you have the same usage winter and summer and therefore the same right. cost. Correct. It's only summer. for the higher Correct. usage that you have higher rates. Right. For those who have outdoor water use. Yeah. Yeah. I said one other thing I wanted to just bring up and, and that is that I know this arbitrarily, we were looking at one, zero to two, three to four, but there, it may be worth having even narrower ones, like maybe, a, I, don't know what the, I don't know what the 50 gallon per. 50 gallon per person per day equates to about two units a month per person. That's why we selected the okay, two right. unit increments. Okay, all right, that's good then. I think we reasoned like that, that we probably wouldn't have a half, if you add a half a person. person yeah. Yeah. That, that's we, easy for people to compute. Another. Much. I just think when we, it's going to take a lot of education, mm -hmm. um, and I think people are going to want to know. They're going to need to know what their peak use is and what their whole pattern looked like over the year to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably not hard to do. They can just look at the graph on their bill for one thing. Right. If we if it shows a year's worth of usage, but I think that's a real opportunity for people to really think about their usage. So, okay. Yeah, I, I think you're right. President Daniels devils in the details. So if there's if there's a plan that once I see the numbers that seems fair, seems defensible, and it'll be based on the numbers in part. You know, it's, if like somebody ends up paying a hundred thousand dollars for water, I don't think that's fair or defensible. You know. Unless, Unless it's, it's way, you know, way, <laughs> 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 but you know, and yeah. Oh, I mean, if someone does that, they really deserve the bill. <laughs> they get to use that much water. Do, do the increments of increase of the cost of the plans and going from the zero to two to the three to four, do they those have to be equal increments? No, no we wouldn't make them equal. I, I would. So we could have a cheaper kind of baseline rate for people who are lower Correct. income. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, the concept here is, is that we would have different costs incur yeah. in the higher plans. Like for one, for instance, is the supplemental supply cost. That would be in the higher plans. Okay. okay. So the cost per gallon does go up. Yeah. So it's inclined. All right. I, and, I mean, I, I think it's a good plan to keep looking into myself. Yeah, yeah um, I'd like to, to see it flip, to, to see more details on it. Um, and the zero to the two unit increments, is that just arbitrary? You said it, that was based 50? on 50 gallons per person per day, assuming one person in a household uses about two units a month. So two people in a household, four yeah, units a month. 1,500 gallons, 30 okay. days. Gotcha. I get it. <laughs> Which that works out nicely. Yeah, accidental. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think one thing that's going to help is rather than bringing, like this report has all kinds of this is impossible and we could do this, we could not do that. We, and if we could break this down into individual decisions that we need to make. If you look at the whole big thing and there, everything is an option, we could change this and change that, and then we'll never reach decisions because it's so complex that we could change this, but what effect does that have over there? And so if we can narrow this down into, you know, for example, how long is the recovery rate? So once you once you bump up, how long do you go to you before you come back down? So that, that's why I was saying there's only my view when there's two you have, that which would need to be modeled and to determine the consequences. Well, to your there's customer. a lot more than that. Yeah. There, there's the ones you've mentioned are there. But mm -hmm. if you look through the report, lots of things are very fuzzy. Oh, we could do this, or we could mm -hmm. do that, or we could do the other thing, and those are options too. And so um, I think we to make decisions effectively. 
rather than look at all the possible things that we could do, we need to look at, you know, we, we need to make a decision about this one thing and what do you think is the right thing for this thing. And, and I think what Sanjay's kind of getting at is in order to model it, mm -hmm. he needed to know if we were doing narrow plans or wide plans sure. and many plans or few plans. Mm -hmm. Once he has that information, which I think has been isolated, he can at least model it and then once we have those well, numbers, then we'll be making You still need to know, you decisions. still need to have a policy about overages mm -hmm. and you still need to know the policy about rebates. You need to, I mean, there are all these different other things are unspecified. Right. They are, but would it make sense to go ahead in a stepwise fashion and, and take these two big factors and what we're looking at is coming back, what I understand is then do a, like a preliminary run. It's not the final, but it's to give us, give you more, uh, okay, you know what, let's, let's stop here and, you know, or go further and we can knock that down kind of like we did Conservation Plus. I mean, it was a similar thing. You saw it and you go, okay, let's evolve it again. Let's, let's move that. I think that's kind of the process you're considering. Yeah, I think once, we, once we're able to get some rates to attach to this, then we can start modeling some customer behaviors. We can look at customer A and they do this and customer B and they do this. And what steps do we, or what policies that we, do we need to put in place that will define those bills that they're receiving and, and the variances that we're gonna allow under those programs, but until we actually know what rates we're looking at and what specific customer types are going to encounter, like you can have a customer that's low all year round, and we they actually may see their bill go down because more of this capacity is now being picked up by our peak users. So you may see a demographic of customer whose rates go down considerably. Um, you may see a customer who has low winter and high summer, uh, you may see a customer that has low summer and high winter. And what do those customers' bills look like? And what policies do we need to play, put in place to manage those specific incidences? So you said that you don't want to do too many runs because it's too complicated. What's a reasonable number of runs? Um, reasonable, you know, I, I think, um, 10 or 12, I mean, it depends That's on- That's higher how, than I thought you were gonna say. I mean, it really depends <laughs> on, you know, it's not so much for us if it's complicated, it's more about time and, and process and, and digestion. It. Yeah. You know, you, you know, cause you, you have only limited amount of time. Right. Right, you don't have, you, you, we can't meet every day. So, I mean, so we can make, you know, we can make a model that's sophisticated enough that can look at, you know, all kinds of scenarios. It's more about process and sort of managing it and making sure we don't you know turn blue to the, f the face you know and there, the 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 things that you need is wide wide number and wide ranges uh, the width the width, the width narrow yeah we yeah i mean narrow we, wide and then how do we define people we don't have to decide that today i mean that's that's the next step right so the next so you know some of the guiding principles that we discovered or we went through is, is that we should focus on single family the next step we, we just discussed is that we should have many and narrow plans. We've talked about narrow being two units or 50 gallons, so that's right. great. We can change, and that can be refined and changed in the model. That's a, that'll be an input. That's not necessarily a big deal. We talked about that if you go over your plan, you'd go into the next plan. So that's that overage. Okay. We talked about a credit that would occur at the end of the year. That would be the, basically the cost associated with pumping and treatment. Right. And so the individual will get a credit associated with that. Um, and sort of from a modeling perspective, there's a lot of policies like the variance and the peels and, you know, but from a modeling perspective, we don't know who had a leak or who doesn't have a leak, right? When we look at the raw data of the customer class of your individual accounts. But what we need to understand is, is well, what do we define as peak? Is it, the, is it that one month? Is it an average of two months or three months? And again, the model will have the ability to change that ability to look at different peaking and we'll look at some options and re make a recommendation and then the second one is is when does someone um sort of roll off the peak and again we'll look at the data and we'll examine it and then we'll come up with a rationality and a logic of why so there's so that's really what, just a few things here that's, yeah. that's my question is so will you come up with something that would be a typical rate and mm -hmm. then how would it affect the rate if you did 
a one month peak versus Correct. a two or three month peak average? And then how would that rate change? You know, if how would that work if you had Rolled them off. come off after three months? Correct. Okay. All right. That's what we're, and then we're going to show you customer impacts because ultimately right. the rates, the bills don't really matter. I mean, they do matter, but what really matters more is how much did that person change? So what we would do is look at a representative year. Yeah. So let's just say 2017 and let's just say hypothetically 2017 repeats itself in exactly the same way, except now people have customer select. Mm -hmm. So we know their bills for 2017. Then we calculate what this bill would yeah. be. And then we can look at the difference in the bill, and then I can tell you these are how many people will see a five dollar increase, ten dollars. Who will see a decrease, and who are those customers? So I disagree okay. with the base assumption mm -hmm. that it's repeatable because I think by putting cool. customers select you said in, if. yeah, I know, but I disagree with it. And it so will change behavior. It will change behavior, mm -hmm. and so it's non-stationary. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I agree. Don't think, I don't think we should try and get it too fine. Okay because it's going to change but you know ballpark to mm -hmm. see, i think is worth exploring to see whether you know it's more defensible fairer and that it's financially stable so i i'd, I'd support going the next step but I, I don't think we should fool ourselves into thinking that whatever you do is can actually be what happens. I 100% agree with you. If, if, if I predicted exactly what would be happening, I always joke I wouldn't be here. I'd right. be in Hawaii Stop. right now or, <laughs> or somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, or maybe in Santa Cruz, <laughs> but permanently. <laughs> but there are a lot of details and complexities. For example, in, in, on page 108, he prevent, presented five separate plans. There's plan A, B, C, D, E, 0 to 2, two 3 to 4, 5 to 6, and then plan E is greater than 8. And each of the plans, you might think, would have a fixed cost. So if you go with plan A, you're paying one cost. B is a different cost. But the problem with plan E, the biggest one, exactly. is that if you're, someone is using nine units and someone is using 100 units, if there's a fixed cost, one person is going to get screwed. Well, I, I, I think. think that he was just showing, for example, plans a, B, C, D, and E. I don't, I don't think we're stopping at plan E. Well, then you may have to go up to double D or... Right, you know, there'll yes. be plan F, Six, G, yeah. 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 Different we might not have letters. <laughs> <laughs> Alphanumeric. Uh, yeah, there's, you're, you're in plan whatever, in that increment. Yeah. Or just yes. drop it, just uh, put them on a completely different schedule if it's such yeah. a wide yes. variation in yeah. volume. Right, so you're play, playing again by the unit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is somehow just gets, goes back to that, I agree. Right. I mean, the board's definitely breaking new ground here. There's no other water agency that does this. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it was said the devil's in the details. So as we take a step, there'll be 10 more questions. Even, you know, we've talked about, well, if you bump up into a plan, you know, that'll make you more aware and you want to use less. It will, but there's also, you know, the loss aversion concept where if you get up there and now you're paying for it, well, I want to use it. So maybe it increases you. So these could be unintended consequences and it, mm -hmm. it, it in, Dear's a, a good discussion. If we uh, go with this plan, there will be surprises. Yeah. We can bet on that. We do. We need to, consequences. We need to accept the report. We so do. I was going to move <laughs> that we accept the report. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've, we've definitely it. provided <laughs> feedback. Second. Yeah, thank you. Got that. <laughs> Second. Yeah, that, there's no, no, no scarcity of that. <laughs> okay. All in favor of accepting the report? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Yes, we're a very shy yeah. board. We just and, have and, no and ideas. Thank you for your good work. I mean, this is really interesting <laughs> and groundbreaking. So, okay, six point five main break road repair. Um, this makes yes, good sense. This is for <laughs> adopting plans and specs and calling for bids to uh, repair um, seven areas that have been damaged by a main breaks the um, uh, the road uh, significant damage. So. Um, Pretty simple. That's. Yep. Right. I guess. Public. Any questions? Questions by the public? If there's no questions by the public, I'll move that we approve both resolutions. Okay. I'll second. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniel? Yes. Thank you. And we go to 6-6, six, six, which is a draft policy for the standing committees. 
Yeah, so the draft policy, about two years ago we started the uh, standing committees and we just wanted to bring better decision making, transparency and value to the customers. So we put these two committees together and they certainly shown, proved their worth. And so now we're coming back with some draft policy for the board to consider uh, and it's shown in the attachment there is really um, where it's shown and, and you know, we go through type and composition. So two board members up to two uh, public members, I think is what the board uh, requested. I would say that um, we would probably want to say it, it could be also more than two for certain committees. I know like for the rate committee, it's an ad hoc committee, but we have more. So I, I would insert that uh, caveat in there. Uh, but that's that's one item uh, looked at each year to make sure we're we're on track sometimes um, you know we may see things we want to change and then like committee member terms we have two years for the board members I would add there again could be re continuously renewed I think that was the intent and then uh, two years for the public members with the option of a two-year renewal the board may want to modify that or not but that's just a something we put out there to start. This is typical of a, another agency or two that we looked at, so we kind of um, use that as a template. So uh, open to suggestions or, or whatever here. Questions? A suggestion. Questions? I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, on page 130 under committee member appointments, you mentioned, as you said, that the Board of Directors will review this each December, which is our policy up till now. Mm -hmm. But then on the next page, you say the term for directors two is years. two years. So that doesn't make sense to review things. Yeah, when that may not be right. Them. We were trying to figure out if, if different things were moving at different times, if whether that would be needed. So maybe it should be two years. I, I see your point. We couldn't quite. If one committee is starting different time, do we need to look at it? Maybe not. Maybe it should be two, just two, if, we, if you're going to go with two. Yeah, you know, I, I think they need to agree with each okay. other. So, so I'm going to mark two, two there. One. I saw that. Um, I well, I thought huh? actually the way I understood that was also that to review how the to do an annual review of how the committee is functioning and whether ch changes needed to be made in mid-year or mid-term. Um, yeah, I, I think it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it was more should be more in alignment, but we it it could be that you could do that. You could take that route, um, but. It should be as the you know committee's term out or whatever the two year whatever you, whatever you make that if two years is what you want so yeah I I agree and where I saw that where was that exactly well one is under on page one thirty understanding a committee member appointments that first uh -huh. sentence after there mentions okay I review every that. year yeah and right and the December. next is the the next page under committee member terms okay yeah it goes to yeah. yeah. I need, they need to be consistent. Yeah, that first one, if you went with two years, we would change the page on page uh, 130 to two. Yeah. Okay. And then I had, I had um, on the meeting protocol, the second paragraph, um, at the very bottom it says, um, if the, in the absence of the chairperson, the vice chairperson shall perform the duties of the chairperson. But in the second line it says they may elect a vice chairperson. I think if you're going to say. Yeah. I think it should just be shall elect a vice chairperson. Okay. Just yep. so that you, you either if you if, if they're going to fill in and there's not one there, that just seems weird. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I agree. <laughs> Another question is on page 130 at the bottom there. You mentioned this three meetings in a row or six in a, in a calendar year. And of course, for example, finance meets four times a year, so six in a year would mean, uh, I don't know, a year a and a half. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, yeah. Uh, I don't know what the, what the intent is there for that. The, well, the intent is if you're absent a lot, uh, the president or the chair and the vice chair have the right to, to say you're not serious about this. So maybe... Um, I just want to say that that'd be fine. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe we should <laughs> simplify, simplify it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe come back with a way. Due to, due to attendance and other factors, if the board, you yeah. know, chair, yeah. okay, okay, okay. And the renewable to two years for the public, for, 
a mm -hmm. two-year term renewable for two more years. Um, I don't think we should limit okay. only two years. Okay. I think the idea was it's not limited. It's okay. just that the idea was that the person could come, that person could still apply again, but you opened it up for applications again. Okay. And there's no. I think that was the idea. I don't think there's a term. You get reappointed, Got but it. it's just so you don't. They just don't go on forever without. Uh, right. No, I agree. Uh, with allowing that. other public members. I'll make that clear though, because I could see that could be confusing. But you're, uh, yeah. Director Lou Hughes, correct, and that was the intent. This may need to come back with a little. Yeah. Refurbishing. We can bring it back. <laughs> Since there's so many things. Bring it back. Put it on consent. I think we we can capture everything and pull it if it's not okay. correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me just make sure I, so two years for board members, continuous renewal, same thing for the public member, except after a two year renewal, we'd bring it back. Um, open it to the public. Open it to the public. We have a process that we talk about there. We know that was very important to the board. And then um, you'll, you will elect a, um, a chair and a vice chair. Uh, we'll get as far as the, um, the chair and the vice chair can just decide if um, they think the person's not performing up to speed to let them go. Okay. Okay. And I think, I think that captures, captures what you're asking. Okay. Another question on page 131 under protocol. You mentioned uh, directors, not members of a committee, may attend as observers. Mm -hmm. what, what legally is an observer? I mean, you, can, you have to sit there and not say anything or... I don't know what for board members you mean yeah yeah it's um you, Mr. Basso can probably well, you can't participate in the decisions yeah but you could do public comment for you example? can make comments but okay. you can't participate in the decision okay so you maybe that's you, you may that attend either. as if you were a member of the public yeah and I think right. Mr. Basso correct me correct I think it's only public comment during oral communications and then can are you allowed to talk during the the rest of the meeting when, on a, when an item comes up, the Brown Act allows anybody to talk during any item when public comment solicited. You don't participate as a member. Okay. But okay. just like any other member of the public can talk on any item. Okay. That's Thank why you. I think that word is unclear. And okay. Say that you attend as if you were a public, uh, a member of the public. Okay. Maybe Good. Mr. Basso has Good. a way to word that. <laughs> yeah. Member. I should have had him look at this. That was not my understanding, but thank you. Okay. Anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner of Aptos. Um, I really appreciate your having the members of the community involved in your policy making and, and advisory committees. And I, I want to urge you to use the wonderful um, What's on Tap newsletter that goes out to everybody already and really, um, you know, put put these positions and, and what the committees are doing on the front page so that your customers see that. A lot of people look at that. Good idea. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, monthly e-blasts that your district sends out. Those go to a lot of people. And um, also don't overlook the use of radio. A lot of people listen to radio. Very few people take a newspaper anymore. Um, maybe the good times, <laughs> you know, one of those that people pick up for free, but very few people take newspapers, unfortunately, anymore. But listen to the radio. And then um, under meeting protocol, thank you for the discussion about the Brown Act. And I think um, urging any of your advisory committee members to attend one of Mr. Basso's excellent workshops that I know he puts on here from time to time would would be a good adjunct to being involved in, in these advisory committees. Thank you. Anyone else? I also noticed that we don't mention here that the public members have to be uh, district, in the district, or district voters, or district customers, or? I thought we did state they have to be customers. Is it? Yeah. Did we say that? I didn't see it. Any district customer interested in serving on a standing committee is invited. Okay. Yeah. That was in the intent. All right. Any but other we'll comments or about this? No? So Someone want to make a motion that we approve this with all these changes we've made? Or request we bring it back, maybe? At a okay. 
just to add, just put it on consent. That's fine. There's enough changes that yeah, I think fine. it's worth it's not just I think it's worth doing that way. Well, is that a motion? Sure. I'll move <laughs> that we bring it back at the uh, next meeting with the, the consent. with the changes. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. So now we go to, I think it's uh, written, written communications. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I thought it was interesting in my neighborhood when some people did vegetation clearing that I saw what was a very odd looking connection to a two inch um, pipe, metal pipe. It seemed active and there was black poly pipe running up the hill. And um, when I had the time to stop and look into it, it was clear it was not connected with the residence next door at 911 Redwood. So I turned it into your district and, and I really want to thank you for taking such rapid and very thorough action. <laughs> um, there was a workman out there, you know, within a couple of days and now everything is gone. The pipe is gone, the metal pipe is gone, the old metal pipe that was there that had been cut is gone, the black poly pipe going up the hill to who knows where is gone. And I want to thank you for taking such quick action. And so I have to ask why um, that quick action has not been taken on a similar, um, what I think is questionable water service connection with, that remains within the Aptos Village project. I know that the one that was on Granite Way um, that has been discussed here many times seems to have gone away, at least it's under dirt or something, but there remains one uh, next to Testorf construction trailer and it does not appear to be metered and there is no backflow. So um, I did respond to Ms. Flock and ask that. Um, I printed out the email. I didn't print out in, in its entirety. I thought I had sent it to your board as well, but it's not included as late communication. So I will resend it so it becomes part of your communication officially. But I have copies of it. Unfortunately, the library seemed to cut off the bottom end of it, but it captured the gist of what I'm talking with you about right now, is why why is there a disparity in the rapidity of action? And um, my final question is, what was that pipe <laughs> on Redwood Drive all about? Um, if I could get an answer, I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Right. See you next week.